Welcome to Real Talk Christian Podcast, where we drink coffee and have real conversations on faith, culture, and society. This is Mark Hyde and Chris Fuller. And on today's episode of Real Talk Christian, we are talking about the church, and not specifically the church at large, but more so the Sunday morning worship experience. Is it for believers? Is it for unbelievers? What on earth are we supposed to do, and does this even matter? Fuller, you ready? Let's go. Thank you for joining us at Real Talk Christian, a place where real Christians talk about real issues impacting the community and the world as it pertains to Christians. Now here are your hosts, Mark Hyde and Chris Fuller. We're actually drinking something that um, we need to apologize for. Janelle, I'm sorry. He, he um, turned to me. So the entire coffee community is going to disown me. Well, first off, we're drinking Tim Hortons, which is yeah, that's good I coffee. love Tim Hortons. Yeah, I, great. Tim Hortons is one of the, it's one of those places where I will intentionally stop and get coffee if I'm driving mm-hmm. up in Minnesota. Well, I don't go to Minnesota, but if I'm in uh, Michigan specifically on vacation, I right. actually intentionally go the north, the longer route, so I can <laughs> right <laughs> drive by Tim Hortons and I no, go it's on delicious. vacation. But it's decaf. It yeah, we're gonna go ahead and blow by that then. Yep, because late. And I want to sleep, and Chris wants to sleep, but well, it's okay. He says late. It's six o'clock. So for like our teenagers, <laughs> it's early. Like they're just getting up and rolling out of bed on a oh, Saturday. Oh goodness, you know? that's just, true. They just woke up for the game, and they're like, "All right, oh, you know, back to bed." And they and we gain an extra hour of sleep, which that so does excited. it. But here's the real question: when 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 it when it's Benny Benny Hinn Day, you know, National Fallback Day, right? <laughs> do you that stay That's up good. an extra hour later? No. Or do you just go, let's get this? No, I go to bed at the same time, and then I just could gain that extra hour of sleep. The problem with the, the daylight saving time switch back and forth is it takes me like a month to adjust to the time. Oh, dude. So, like, you know, normally I'll be going to bed at like 9, 10 o'clock. Well, now it's going to be like 8 or 9 o'clock, and then I'll be getting up at like three o'clock instead of four o'clock and the kids man like I, now elliot has always responded well to falling back because mm-hmm. we're always just like nobody it's not time to wake up yet and go back to sleep i like, just go back to sleep but daddy i'm not tired i don't care Shh. go turn on puppy dog pals Shh. <laughs> puppy dog no dino dana bro dino <sighs> dana Fancy Nancy, man. I have two girls. That's, I love Fancy that, Nancy. That's my show. Actually. But but either way, so we are falling back tomorrow. I'm actually probably going to stay up an extra. Which if you if you <laughs> think about sleep. it, by the time this episode airs, it's going to be like a month we've been falling back. So I'll finally be in the swing of the routine. So you'll be actually caught up by the time that right. this goes back into the 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 airwaves, the pod waves, the pod the waves. Pod waves. <laughs> but either way, dude, I am excited for today's conversation because this is another one that we don't fully agree on. I, I think you're starting to get me more on on Team Fuller though. Yeah, with this conversation, I'm excited. But but today's conversation is focused on the church. What's the purpose of the church? Mm, the yeah. Sunday morning gathering experience, right. which is what the fancy mega church they they use the word Sunday morning experience now, right. um, versus like a worship gathering or worship service right. or or anything like that. Um, and the reason why I'm kind of on the fence on the fence with this is I, I struggle with it. I right. I, I really do. Um, but to, to set the tone for today's conversation, um, the the best place I think to start it with this is to understand the two polar polarities polarities two yeah. opposites at end. Um, Andy Stanley, which is a guy that I respect, I think he's one of the best communicators to date right now. Um, there's not a person who does anything better than Andy Stanley in some areas. Um, but Andy Stanley's church, North Point down in Atlanta, um, they have a church motto. And this church motto has actually exploded, and tons of churches have this motto now. And there's actually one one main one, and one goes along to it. The main one is the fact of, we want to be a church that unsafe people love to attend. Mm. Um, that's, that's the main push. <laughs> and then the other <laughs> secondary push that underlies that, and it's on their website, and mm-hmm. I'm not trying to name bash it again. I love Andy Stanley. I have his books. I teach some of his materials. It's good stuff. Um, but the other one is before you, um, before you believe you belong. So before you believe 
you belong. In other words, like before <laughs> you have to follow Jesus, you can be a part of our church gathering. I'm biting my tongue. So on I, this I know that's, that's, that's the one side, but then you have the complete other side of the equation, which is the fact of churches is like, in fact, we don't even need to be prepared for those who are not saved because it doesn't matter to them at all. In fact, let's make the church so. And in, in, um, a friend of mine, church was this way, and I even asked them about it, and they go, "Yeah, it's intentional." Of the entire service is supposed to make you feel like crap and dirt if you're not saved. Like the building, it's all Christianese. The well, the building is so elaborate that you mm. feel out of place. Everyone dresses to the nines because you put on your best for God. Um, because we're not dressing for the outside people. We're dressing for the audience of one who happens to be a king. When was the last time you wore your PJs in front of the king? Was <laughs> I have an opinion on that too? Wait. Can I just say something there? What? Uh, it says where there's two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. So what if you're rolling up into Walmart and you got like two or three Christians walking in their PJs? <laughs> um, we call that the budget chart. <laughs> We call that ghetto budget. Uh, sorry. Church. Anyways, go um, on. But then you have like, and, and so with those churches that don't necessarily care about the unsaved people, not don't care, but a lot of them will have more liturgical style church services mm -hmm. where it's you you stand, you sit, you kneel, you get up. I'm very the the liturgical Episcopalian Pentecost, not Pentecostal. Hello, Presbyterian Catholic. Uh, Catholic view of the church model, mm -hmm. and then you have churches in there and all over in between. Um, and so this is something that I don't think a lot of our church people understand um, in terms of, because they just don't know. They, they've they always gone to church, they've been part of Christendom, they sit in a service, and then they pick up their kids and they go home. That's just right. kind of what, what church actually is. So to start the conversation, Fuller, I want to toss you the ball and ask you this question. Okay. In your opinion, what is the church if someone said hey fuller what's the like what is the church what is this thing well how would you answer that i would say the church um one is believers um you have to be a believer to be the church and, and, and christianese what's a believer so a believer is someone who has surrendered their life to christ um, and accepted the payment that he made for their sins so um, so for lack of a better word, a uh, quote unquote Christian. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, believer Christian. Yeah. Interchangeable for yep. me. Sorry. It's Christianese. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so first you got to be a Christian. Um, and then to me, it's just like what I, what I quoted with my joke about Walmart. It does say where two or three are gathered in his names, there he is in the midst. So, a church, if you look back in the early days, back in the early days of the church, um, it was a gathering of believers, Christians, in homes. Um, and that was that was church. Um, they didn't have elaborate buildings. They did go to the synagogue or temple um, in often. Fact, yeah, often. In fact, yeah, they went every, uh, well, Sabbath but day, every Saturday until they it was out. That's where they were gathering as a as a group to tell the good news of Christ. That's one of the places they stopped um, because it was for, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So um, a lot of Jews back in those days missed missed Christ, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees. I mean, they're the ones that called for his execution. Um, so I think uh, the church is anywhere where there's two or three gathered in his name, though, that have the intentional purpose of seeking God out together, living life together, and seeking God together. So when you hear of these churches now that are on mission, quote-unquote, is, is that, you think, a part of the criteria? Um, explain what you mean by mission. Okay, so um, right now, I mean, this is part of the... And, and I agree with this, okay, so I'm not bashing it, but um, a lot of churches do, is like Rick Warren, the Purpose Driven Church, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is what is the what is our church trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Like for ours, is our church is, uh, we're um, creating passionate followers of Jesus by impacting our world for Christ one life at a time. Like mm -hmm. that's that's right. everything. That's our basic, our motto, our mission right. statement. And, and I boil that down to impacting our world for Christ one mm -hmm. life at a time. And right. then even farther, it's just one life at a time. Right. So do you, does, does a church even need a purpose then, or is it just a group of well, Christians let, who gather together? Let me um, let me be devil's advocate here and, and toss a question back your, your oh, way. Oh, okay. So we talk about, we, we were talking about earlier, the 80-20 
rule in mm-hmm. church. You have 80% of the people that just attend the church service on right. Sunday and 20% of the people who actually serve. So would you say that those 80% of the people have the same mission statement as the church, as as the gathering of believers on Sunday? It, it depends if you believe that the mission can be accomplished on a Sunday. Mm. I would say that uh, those who serve... Um, fully believe in that mission, and I, I would say, I'd venture to say that the 80% that don't serve, don't do outreach, um, have a different mission. Uh, not that mission is against God or anything like mm-hmm. that. It may be um, a similar mission, but not the one that the church, you know, not the outreach of um, like our block party. Oh, right, yeah. You know that 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 they don't they would rather impact people they work with mm. rather than their community. So it's just that's a different mission, right? You know? And I will say this: I know we have a lot of people in our church listening. I don't think our church follows this eighty twenty principle. I oh mean, no, we're way with VBS. Than that. I mean, we're probably seventy five percent who do, who do serve, serve right? or eighty percent who do serve in some way, shape, or oh, form. Oh, and I think that's not just VBS. I think it's oh, with well, the week. With, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's everything. Uh, there's so many people in our church that that serve. But when we could talk about the eighty twenty rule, we're talking about the Church uh, at large Christianity, in America. Yeah, Christianity yep. Church, uh, uh, even worldwide, um, you know, England, stuff like that. I don't, I think... Th- well, the church is dead over in England. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's that's what brings it up to 80% is that church over in England. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you what. <laughs> Spurgeon's rolling over in his grave. <laughs> so so here's the question then. What what spurs that? What What's created that mindset, that mentality, that consumerism mentality that we face in the church today? I mean, I have my opinions on it. Let's hear your opinions. All right, so this is where I struggle. Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna let people in and know the the pastor who struggles with the idea of corporate worship and gatherings. Okay, and so this is gonna <laughs> this may sound a little ironic because I'm I'm still working it out, man. I'm still working it out, but it's one of those things where I've been wrestling very hard the last um, probably about a month and a half. I was reading a book, um, understanding Anabaptism, okay. and I've been taking deep dive into Anabaptists lately, and um, Anabaptist, for those who don't know, it just means those who baptize adults after you follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. And is is Southside considered an Anabaptist? Yes, but historic Anabaptism that came out of the Germany and German movement, whereas Southern Baptist came out of the British Baptist mm-hmm. movement. Same right. time frame. I won't bore you with the history. But either way, so, so classic Anabaptist belief had this thought that um, the church worship gathering experience, whatever you want to call it, was corrupted and destroyed when Christianity became legalized and then became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. And the, the whole idea is the fact is is when, when Christianity became what was now known as Christendom, when it became institutionalized, it actually lost pretty much everything. Because before, the early church, would they would gather together every single day at dawn because they wanted to worship together in fellowship with one another. And right. we read in Acts 2 what they did. They broke bread, they devoted themselves to the prayers, um, the apostles' teachings, and, and to the communion of the saints. Right. Um, and that's what these churches did. And But when Christianity was outlawed, it was all out on the fringes. But then when the Roman Empire brought it and institutionalized, and all of a sudden, pastors became people of power. Mm-hmm. Churches became places where instead of giving your tithe and offerings to feed the poor and the hungry um, amongst Christians and others, all the tithe and offerings went to building these elaborate buildings. Right. And you see where I'm going. Yep. And temples and cathedrals and this, that, and the other. And then pay for crusades. It, well, well, that's what <laughs> indulgences did. But but we created yeah, this diff. thing where the pastor became the authority. And in, in mm-hmm. fact, in the Catholic Church, the reason why they kept that Latin language so important was the fact of, no, you commoners, you're not smart enough to understand the Bible and right. the Scriptures. Right. Let, let let the professionals teach you what the Bible says mm-hmm. rather than you read it, which that's when Martin Luther was like, heck no. And John, um, was it John Huss? No, um... Tyndale, Tyndale from over in England, William he died. Of, he he died in the stake for translating the Bible into English back right. in the 50, early 1500s or something like that. But but it's the fact of have we as a church created this ecosystem and ecosphere where we tell people, hey, just don't don't, and we tell people, hey, don't invite your friends to Jesus, but hey, invite your friends to church, bring them into the pews, let the professional musicians 
lead you in this beautiful worship. And the professional pastor show you and tell you what the Bible says, and then after that, hey, we'll see you next week. So have we created this whole thing on a Sunday morning where we, the, the way everything is designed to work and operate, have we pretty much told people, hey, this is designed for you to come and sit and just listen? Now, at the same time, early church, there was an elder who actually expounded what they read. We actually have writings from uh, first and second, uh, no, 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 sorry, third, third and fourth centuries of how the early church worked after mm-hmm. the apostles. And it was the fact of, yeah, they read a lot of scripture together. They prayed a lot together, which we don't do a lot on Sunday mornings in today's right. modern worship. Ex- well, I always call it experience, but today's modern worship experience. Um, but it has turned into a let's put on a show so that way people on the outside don't think we're too weird. So they kind of want to come in and go, oh, the music sounded pretty good. That message made me feel pretty good. Maybe Mm -hmm. I want to do this. Yes. Yes, we are consumer-driven. Right. We are (laughs) consumer-driven. And in one sense, I mean, and and I I wasn't planning on getting here at this point. Oh, yeah, you were. At this point? (laughs) Um, Is the fact of, is this something that, I mean, this is the way Christendom has been since the fourth. Uh, I would say the third. No, no, no. Let's go back a little bit. It's been this way since probably the ninth century, eighth century. Yeah. Um, where there has been a pastor and then the people and whatever you want to call the the, the, the people in the congregation. Mm-hmm. So, is this something that we should just accept and move on and grin with and figure out how we can best work the system, or how should we as Christians view our church worship gatherings? Well, I think that. Uh there's a pretty strong movement that's been taking place since the late 80s, early 90s, mm. even through the day, and that's called the house church movement. I think there are Christians out there that are trying to break this Holy Roman Empire uh, outli- outline of how church is supposed to go, because it's supposed to be um, more than just one person opening the scriptures, because we're all infallible and uh, can miss things, and so if we can't right judge and and talk together and uh, be able to test every spirit uh, and we're just being preached at and we're just taking that and not looking into the word for ourselves it's a very dangerous place to be in which is what was happening back in the the Holy Roman Empire church when they were speaking Latin they they didn't understand the language or how to read it and so as they were being preached at they just had to take it at face value for they could have been saying anything so uh, okay uh, yeah yeah okay well you know they said I got to pay my penance, you know. <laughs> I I, I got to do that. So yeah, I, um, I I think that too many Christians are um, trying to think how to put this delicately. <laughs> Don't do it. It's real talk, baby. Uh, Let's go. I want to call them fair weather fans. Hmm. Okay. Which which I mean, Kyle so, been wrote a book, not a fan. So. Uh, uh, what I mean by fan weather fans is uh, they don't want to put the work in. They're okay with being a Christian if they can go to church and listen on Sunday and say, hey, man, it's a great message. This is awesome, and I'll take that message. But they never dig into the Scriptures for themselves to make sure what the message is being said matches up with the Scriptures. Um, I know I've told this in the previous podcast, and you and I have talked about it, Mark, but when any of you guys are up preaching, I'm, I'm reading – not just the scriptures you're reading, but the context of where those scriptures lie in. Right. You know, I'm reading. So you'll see me looking down. It looks like I'm not paying attention. No, no, and you, I might, you're flipping through I'm, stuff. Yeah, man. I might be missing some stuff, but I want to test, make sure what you guys are saying is 100% biblical. And uh, I trust you guys. I love you guys. I tell, you know, Pastor Scott all the time, like, I trust my family with you, so that's why we come here. If I didn't trust you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I can relax on my responsibility to myself and my faith and my family. Um, I have to be diligent and search the scriptures. And I think that's the, the stagnant place that most of the Christians are in today. They're okay with this Sunday service um, because they don't have to really do anything. You know, hey, it's an extra bonus point from the pastor, though. If you bring your Bible, hey, <laughs> Bible, uh, Bible uh, being present, pastor's always like, oh, you brought your Bible. Yeah, it's like a gold star. You know, <laughs> yep. but if it wasn't for that, I don't think there would be any. I don't think there would be any Bibles present. It'd be like they 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 want it all up on the screen. Hey, I want the scriptures up on the screen. We do that even at Southside for people yep, that we forget. Um, we got scriptures up on the screen, but for me, it's like I love reading out of my King Jimmy. So, 
you know, I don't know what y'all read. <laughs> I think it's New King Jimmy most of the time is what we got. Well, when Scott preaches. Depends who's preaching. Yeah. So she's got the ESV. I got the CSB, and Scott's got the New King Jimmy. Yep. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's um, as Christians, and I'll just speak to Christians in America, and I'm going to throw a blanket statement, and I realize that it's not everybody. But I think Christians have grown content and lazy in their faith. Mm. And so that's why they're okay um, with being directed on a Sunday gathering. I think the Sunday gathering, and you and I talk about this, but I think the Sunday gathering is for multiple churches. So when I say multiple churches, like, what are you talking about, multiple churches? So what I mean by that is we have something called a connect group at Southside. To me, that's a gathering of more than two or three believers with the set purpose of studying the Word, praying together, and living life together. Um, that's church. To me, that's church. It's supposed to be a tight-knit group that can really speak into each other's lives, that is not being preached at by one person who knows nothing of what's going on in your life. Mm. You know, um, thank God for Scott. <laughs> Scott really takes takes a good interest. You take a good interest, in, and so Shay takes a good interest in trying to get to know people. But how, we got, a, what, a few hundred people in our church? There's no way you could know everything that's going on in the personal lives of a few hundred people with three of you. Oh, and even if you have a conversation with someone, how, how likely are they to, to tell the truth? divulge <laughs> that? Right. Oh, how are you doing today, Mark? Well, right. 20 minutes later. Right. At the end of a Sunday service when everybody's wanting to go home. You know, you, it's just exactly. it's just not going to happen. And so um, when, I, when I say church, I, I believe it's those those intimate meetings where we live e- with each other. Um, we break bread with one another. We live life with one another. We know each other's faults and weaknesses um, so we can help each other. And I think that's the way that we're supposed to. That's the way the early church set it up for a reason. And, and this is where I think Andy Stanley would actually agree with you. Like, I was looking at what? his website earlier with, with their groups. and Because, you know, Andy Stanley's church, they have, I mean— Thousands. I mean, I, I wouldn't be shocked to hear the words that they're close to that fifteen thousand or more mm-hmm. mark member or whatever. Um, but he says that the reason why they have and they, this is interesting. They don't have membership. Mm-hmm. They say if you're going to be a member here, you have to do these four things. You don't sign a covenant. Right. You have to actively participate. And if you drop out of one or two, we you're not a member here anymore. Hmm. Which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, but one of those things, and one of them is serving. Like, you have to serve somewhere, no questions asked. Mm-hmm. If you don't serve, you're not a part of this church. And and so in some sense, I like the fact that some churches don't do a membership because it's not a countryside. It's like like, like the country club right. mindset where, oh, you know what? If you sign this dotted line and, and do X, Y, V, this, that, and the other, you get all these extra benefits and bonuses and packages. It's almost like if you pay for a country club thing, you, you expect all these things in return. Right. A lot of people think that of church membership. Of, oh, I joined this church so now i expect you to get up me all these things to return rather right. than contribute in come at my beck and call <laughs> but what uh what north point says with their um their group specifically is the fact of you have to be a part of a group in order to be considered a core person inside mm-hmm. of north point and the reason is is inside of there that's where people know what's going on people can pray for you but this is what's super cool is the fact of that's when um that's where the accountability comes, and you cannot be forgotten about. Because a lot of people at church will show up at church, and then they'll just disappear for, honestly, three months before sometimes right. people even notice it, because mm-hmm. they're not involved in anything. Whereas if in our small group, if all of a sudden Soche and Marianne, sorry, I, I, I know you guys would not do this, is if they were just if they just disappeared out the face of the earth for three weeks, well, whose job is it to go get them? Everybody's. <laughs> it's our, well, it's our small group's job to right. go get them. It's not... The whole church right. has to go get them. It should be our small group to go to go get them. So people aren't forgotten. They're not falling through the cracks. So because there's a lot more accountability in a group than there are with 200 right. people. Well, so we've talked about you know my point of view from the one end of what I think that um, church should be mm-hmm. and why, and, and it's very similar to what you were saying. Um, I'm going to speak to the to North Point Church. Is that what it was North called? North Point. Yeah. Okay. So and, and um, I wouldn't call it, it seeker sensitive because that's not the right word. Because I'm actually South Side. You'll. I might go into it. We're we're seeker sensitive in some regards too, um, but it's more the fact of they want to be the attractional model. That's so, what it's called now, the attractional model. Yeah. So I want to speak to something you said though. You know, they have to be a part of these four things. They have to be right yep. in order to be considered a member. There's no membership or covenant thing to sign or to commit to. Yep. Correct. Um, you have to be careful because we have one end where you have people that 
get in a small group in a membership. And usually, like at, at Southside, you know, you got to go through a class. You got to meet with the pastor. You got to you got to have a, a conversation before right. you can even join membership. Yeah, this says connect in a group, serve strategically, inviting others, and giving systematically. So, therefore, to me, that almost sounds like uh, what are they called? Are the Mormons? Are the one? Are they the ones that walk around with the the white shirts and the black? Uh, Jehovah Witnesses Jehovah and Witness Mormons, Mormons do. Okay. But so, that's what it sounds like to me. You, you got to kind of earn your way in. Mm. Um, you have to be careful with that because uh, are they faking it till they make it? You know, we had this conversation a few podcasts ago. Um, are they faking it till they make it just so they can check off a box? Oh yeah, I belong. I'm a member of a church because I do this, this, and this. Well, that's not how salvation works. <laughs> right, salvation right. doesn't work by you have to do these certain things in order to be a member of the body of Christ. Um, so you have to be careful with those types of things. There's two ends of the spectrum. You know, there's you got to serve or you don't have to. You, know, you don't have to do anything. You become a member. And I think both ends of those spectrum are wrong, that there's a real fine line that you have to walk of um, you'll know the true members by what fruit they bear. Mm, okay. Um, I so think, they will just naturally do these things. Or or just even, you know, in the Sunday gatherings, which I believe it are, you know, from my point of view, Sunday gatherings are great. It's a collective group of bodies of believer into a central body. Mm. And I honestly think that um, I know I came from a, a house church in Niles, and we actually used to, up in Niles, they do a, a church, uh, what is it called? It's church night, and where every church in Niles gets together. Like every little house it's, church? No. Or like every institutional church has. In the city of Niles? In, in the city of Niles, really? gets together in one place and has a meeting and has, ha, you know, worships together, prays together, all this stuff together. They do it once a month and That's they're committed really cool. to that. So it's the corporate gathering of the bodies. So, um, I believe it's the same. It's, it's these connect groups are supposed to be small portions of the body that are in that intimate part, and then you expand out into the. So you got your inner. Uh, let me explain it this way: you have your inner circle, which is your family, okay? Your, your yep. children, wife, husband, so on and so forth. Father, mother. That's your inner circle. Your uh, next circle out is your church or your connect group. Okay. Next next circle out is your corporate Sunday gathering. And then your next circle out is your city, your community, that gathering. Um, I think all those circles are meant to be together. You're supposed to do all of them. What, what, what is it, like a co co-centric circle? Is it, I think that's what it's called. I don't know. I don't they know. They all have the same starting point, though. Yes, right. Yeah, where God's at the middle. <laughs> he's, right. yep. he's the dot at the middle. So, And we're all rotating around him. Right. So um, I think it's very, I think it's very important to make sure that we realize that and not take – um, family is one circle, and then totally skip over that intimate small gathering where we get to know each other and live life with each other and go straight to the corporate worship. Because if we do that, then we lose something. We, you, you, there's a reason why those circles are closer to that, that God and you relationship, because the closer those are to that dot in the middle, um, the more helpful they will be. The further the way they are, they, they're still good, but they're not as helpful to you and your walk or to... Um, your impact on the community. So so coming from the pastor side, can I tell you something that really bugs me and really annoys me about church people? <laughs> I don't know. I'm one of the members at your church, so I'm kind of scared now. <laughs> but go for it. Fire away. No, no. It's more so the fact of when there's people in the church and they've been coming for a while and, and they're they're attending and then they just leave because they're like, oh, I felt like no one loved me or take, took care of me mm. or, or no one knew what was going on, this, that, and the other. And, and you look at it, and, and you just look at it, and you're kind of like, okay, so what have you been doing? Well, I've been coming here faithfully to Sunday church for 25 years, and I've been giving faithfully. And it's like, that it? What else is there? Um, A lot. <laughs> everything? Yeah. Like, and, and so it, it bugs me when a lot of people just assume that just going to church on a Sunday morning will create that intimate gathering. Right. Now, I will say this is, and this is where... I think we, as the church, needs to do a better job with being seeker-sensitive is the fact of, are we setting our church families up in such a way when when people come looking for Jesus, 
that were ready to show them Jesus. Mm-hmm. And and this is when I say like like I'm actually trying, and this is part of what my responsibilities are now is. People don't like this word, but I like this word is how can we be seeker sensitive? In other words, how can we be sensitive in terms of how can we be conscientious of those people who are looking for Jesus to be able to plug them in, to engage them in our body in some way, shape or form, not just how to give them a good worship experience. And that was a good word, Pastor. But no, how do we actually plug them into people of our body. And this is where the struggle comes because like with our small group, for example, you know, what happens if our small group gets too big or our small group is doing our job and we're, we're actually inviting people and we're expecting people and people come and our group gets too big. And do we birth a new one and then birth a new one and birth a new one and then birth a new one because we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and telling people about Jesus and people are coming to the faith. Mitosis. You know what mitosis is? Isn't that kind of where it kind of just comes big and then kind of just the boop. cell grows to a certain size and 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 it kind of it splits. it splits it splits but it's still from the same cell but it it creates another cell form it's mitosis right. and so that's um I'll I'll give you this model this um, example so um, we're supposed to go forth and make disciples right right so when you make a disciple uh, what is the definition of a disciple to you, Mark? What, what what do you think the definition of a disciple is? I would say who's someone who's fully committed to following Jesus. Not just a church attender, but in terms of they, and, and I don't even want to do the checklist of, they read their Bible and pray every day, but I'm talking, no, they their lifestyle lives with a Christian worldview and wants to honor God and all so, they do and so pursuit of holiness and all that. Let's, uh, let's change the word disciple to apprentice, okay? Okay. So what's the definition of apprentice? Someone who studies under the master to right. in order to become the mm-hmm. master one day. Yeah, studies under a journeyman. Right. All right, so I, I'm coming at it from a— Union worker guy, yeah, let's so, go. So, you, you know, uh, I'm actually getting ready to start an apprenticeship program at the place where I work to become a mechanic there. So I start there. As in you will become the apprentice to become So I, I'm, mechanic? So I am becoming—they don't call it an apprenticeship. They call it a— something else but it's it's, it's an apprenticeship. It so I'm starting as an apprentice and I'm learning from these guys who um who are going to teach me what they know, right? They're not they're not the top of the line master mechanics. They're they're lower on the on the low, but they're going to they're going to teach me what they know. And then in in a year or so, they're going to release me to start doing work on my own. Not that I've learned everything, but I've learned well, enough, enough to seek out. So I take that same principle and I and I bring it into my discipleship. Yes, they're learning from the master. But if disciples waited to go out until they fully learned from the master, none of the apostles would have ever done anything. Right. Because they were not masters. And we will never be masters. There's only one joke. master. Right. Yeah, there's only one master. But there's a point where you come to where you're no longer eating spiritual milk. You're you're eating that spiritual meat. Mm-hmm. And you're really digging in. And when let, let's just take me and you for an example, okay? So when I've taught you everything I, that I could teach you, right, then I say, now go make disciples. <laughs> you know, God, Christ told, commanded me to go make disciples. I brought you in as a new believer. I've, I've helped you along in your faith and taught you the things that I know, and I feel that you're at a point where you can make your own disciples. I'm not leaving you out to dry. I'm still there as a resource. You can still c- connect with me. We should still connect with each other, but go off and make disciples now. And I send you off, just like Paul did Timothy. You know, Timothy probably didn't know everything that Paul knew, and Paul didn't know everything that Jesus knew. You know what I mean? But, but, knew but they knew enough and knew that they still had those resources that if something arose, they could, they could go back. But Paul sent Timothy off, and so on and so forth, and that's how the church grew. It wasn't constantly being stagnant. It was you learn. And, and you know, I look at an apprenticeship program. Most apprenticeship programs take a couple of years. Well, being a Christian, it may take longer than a couple of years. It may take two years. It may take five years. It may, it's going to differ from person to person right. and, and really their desire towards God. But there should never be a stagnant. And stag- they're not at work 40 hours a week. Right, right exactly. So, But, I mean, we should be meditating upon the Word day and day night. Day and night. So um, I think that... In the case of like our small group, it is growing. Our small group is growing massively over the past two years since I've been here. We're shrinking a little bit, but a little bit now. But we were expounding leaps and bounds. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to that point, you look at the people, 
in the group and you go, you're ready, you're ready, you're ready, go forth and make disciples. And then they break off. They, they start that mitosis process where they start to begin their own cell. And that's, have you ever seen the movie Pay It Forward back in 2000? It had. Uh, I mean, I, there's a pay it forward social media thing right now. Yeah, well, it, it probably derived from this. Yeah, it was, it, it's the fact that there was a there was this whole like recently at McDonald's they had a pay it forward um, experiment where if you paid for right. someone else's food, would the per- next person pay for the next person's? And it went right. like thirty five deep or something right. like that. So it's it's almost like a, a discipleship pay it forward. Once they reach a certain spot, they pay it forward and they go out and they make disciples. So once they've gathered what they feel that they have and what the person that's teaching them feels that they have the necessity to go do and make disciples and that person sends them out. It should never be a, well, you're all, we're, this group is so big and none of us feel ready. Right. And none of us, I, I don't feel you're ready. Like if I was the leader of that group, right, I don't right. feel like you're ready to lead discipleship, but I'm going to push you out anyways. No, you never want to do that. And so sometimes you have to say no to incoming people. You have to say, hey, I know you want to come to our group. Our group is is beyond full right now, um, but let me... Let's find you something. Here's, an, here's another group that is very similar to us, and I think you'll enjoy it, and plug them in somewhere else. Uh, we can't just take everybody in. It's, it's my godfather, um, before he passed away, he was really strong on preaching love and gentleness, and he always said that uh, he was huge on this this concept. And he said, how can I... He goes, I have a bowl of porridge, and I can pull, pull my bowl of porridge and feed three of us, me, myself, and two others. But if I grab 10 people and divvy out my porridge into all their bowls, ain't nobody's ain't, full. everybody's going hungry. Nobody has anything. Nobody's full. So you have to limit yourself. There's a reason why Jesus didn't take on 5,000 disciples. He took on 12. And then even beyond that, he took in three, three clothes. Right. And so we have to... Look at Christ and what he did and and follow his model. If if the Son of God can't take on any more than twelve and three close, why would we want to try to take on fifteen or twenty? Right. Yeah, it's a joke. You, you and that's where the, the church, um I, I think a lot of people can be the pew warmers mm-hmm. um because their gifts aren't being sought out. Um uh, there are leaders, natural leaders, that know the Scripture and know God in the church that are pew warmers. Hmm. So, but because so, they haven't been asked, a lot of people, if you don't ask them, they, <laughs> they yeah. don't do nothing. But if you go and seek them out and go, hey, um, you know, you've, you and I have had these conversations for a while, and, and we've grown close, and I, I know I can trust you. Um, hey, would you like to start a, a connect group, a small group, a house church, whatever you want to call it? Um, but start this process of making disciples. I have this group. You know, don't just be like, oh, do it, and then leave them high and dry. Say, I have these people I need to plug in, and I need somebody that I know can give them the Word of God and teach them. Would you do it? And then wait for the response. <laughs> so so let me get back to the, I mean, it's, we're already at Sorry, the 40-minute yeah. mark. No, it's good, it's good stuff. I mean, my, but my thought goes back to two questions then, and I don't know if we're able to answer these today. Maybe we can part two of this stuff later. But... Um, my first question is then is okay. So the Sunday morning experience, if it's a gathering of a bunch of little house churches into one, what should the style look like? Because it's going to look different based on who wants yeah. it. Now, because then you got some people are like, oh, well, my house church wants a quiet. My church wants a loud. My church wants a DJ. Like you, you know, in, in terms of the, the the small cells inside of it. So. My question would be is, hey, how do we create the Sunday morning worship mm-hmm. service that honors God and edifies it? And then at the flip side, do we, in your opinion, do we need to be prepared for those who are coming from the outside? Um, Two questions. We're, we're at this. Uh, w- what's our time now? 40 minutes exactly. Should we part two this? I think we need to part two this. All right, man. Because those, so, those are some massive massive topics and that's, that and those that two to... questions right there will sum up if my job will continue after tonight <laughs> <laughs> that's what i do so all right so let's end this conversation we'll get to a part two this is good stuff but fuller do you have a fun fact or do i need to stall for a minute you know what i do have a 
fun fact. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I always pretend I'm surprised that you have a fun fact. We've but been doing this for, this is episode like 17. No, I don't something. know. How, I don't I, even I'm know. lost at our episode. Who knows? We're, we're, I'm glad that everybody is still listening. Dude, <laughs> I hope they're still listening. Dude, we're getting close to episode 20. We got to do something special on episode We got to do something special. Oh, I have an idea. All right. I have an idea. All right. We'll, I have we'll an idea. talk about it. All right. Anyways. All right. What's this so fun my fact? fun fact, Walmart has a lower acceptance rate than Harvard. What, say that again? Walmart has a lower acceptance rate than Harvard. What? Harvard might be hard to get into with a 4.5% admittance rate. But try this on for size. Only 2.6% of Walmart applicants are accepted. How about them apples? Now we realize that this comparison isn't exactly flawless, but you have to admit that it's funny fact. <laughs> Dude, what? I don't even know what to do with that because I've seen some of the workers at Walmart. Yeah, well, they're the cream of the crop, obviously. I will say this, though. <laughs> Soche complains about our Walmart. He's ready to write corporate about it because he comes from Walmart headquarters down in Arkansas. Yeah, he goes, G- Gucci Walmart. Like, th- like when we would go to Martin's, he goes, dude, our Walmarts were better than your better than your Myers. Like, that's yeah. that's his Walmart. But either way, that is. <laughs> so if you can't get into Harvard, you ain't getting into Walmart. Heck that's what no. I learned tonight. <laughs> All right. See you guys next time. Later. Thank you for listening to Real Talk Christian. To help get our podcast into the ears of other people who need to hear these conversations, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. To keep the conversations going, feel free to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and share our content with others. See you next time.